Hello, everybody, and thanks for tuning in to Between Two Stands, a show that takes a closer look at the personalities that make up the Detroit Symphony Orchestra. My name is Andres. I'm Scott. I'm Abe. Welcome, guys. Hey, how's it What's going? going on? Uh, I just figured we'd jump right in, and, and uh, we got a, a kind of a specific question, but a good question from Kimberly Hickey. She said, this question is for Scott. How difficult is it to play the horn? I play the clarinet and I'm thinking about learning to play the horn. So what would be your wow. sage advice, Scott? Um, oh, it, it's kind of a tricky question because everybody talks about like how the horn is this difficult instrument. And I think at one point we were in the Guinness Book for being the most difficult instrument to play. But I don't know. I mean, the only other instrument I ever played was piano. And... I didn't love to practice the piano, so it was very difficult for me. But the horn, because I loved the sound and I wanted to make it happen so much, it seemed easier. And it only has three keys, so it's, it's easier, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so many answers to this question. You want to punch, um, <laughs> me. You want to punch me right now. <laughs> well, it has more than three keys. Oh, it has, most of them have four. Some of them have uh, five. But, oh, shows how much um, I know. Yeah, I mean, yeah, <laughs> but way too, it's, it's too much. <laughs> yeah. um, so with the, the thing with a, a brass instrument is it's a tube. And like any tube, the higher you get, the closer the notes get together. So uh, I don't know, did, did y'all ever play with a whirly tube? One of those pieces of plastic that's got the yeah. ridges and you swirl it around and it goes, woo, 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 yeah. woo, woo. And then, and then if you swirl it faster, it's like, woo, 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 woo. And yeah. then if it's like a little bit faster, it's like, woo, 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 woo. Yeah. well, the, uh, I mean, those things were really hard to do. Um, so the horn is kind of like that, but as the higher you go, the closer the notes get. So at the bottom, it's like, so they get a, a lot closer together right, the higher you, you go. Can you sing that again, please? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's the harmonic. <clears throat> yeah, you're on the harmonic series, yeah. and that's what I'm describing. But the horn is a very long instrument that's just been coiled uh to be smaller. So it's high brass with a smaller mouthpiece. And so we're kind of like, it's the same length as an F tuba. But because of our mouthpiece, we're playing in the extreme high register of the instrument all the time. So the notes are really close together and therefore easy to uh, predict incorrectly. You, we get accidental notes. Uh, I don't want to call them wrong. They're just unintended <laughs> notes. I'll, I'll, I'll steal I, that one. I like that. I like that. I'm gonna start using How that. long? How long is the horn when well, you, if you were to if you were to uncoil it? It, it sort of depends on what model horn you have. Uh, a natural F horn is twelve feet. Uh, what the one I have, I think, is seventeen or eighteen feet long. It's a, a double horn, and then we have okay. triple horns that have more keys. <laughs> the reason <laughs> why I said that is is, is there, there, there's this funny story in my high school where this this woman came in. She's like. Yeah, my son's not too smart, and so I want him to play trumpet because it only has three keys, and we're all just like, <laughs> uh, we see wow. where, we see where he, where he gets it from. <laughs> well, well, maybe she's totally right, and that's the best thing for him. Yeah, exactly. Maybe, maybe he's in an orchestra right now. I don't know. Yeah. But um, I was wondering, like, I don't know, the difficulty with horn is definitely more like if it's in your ear – and you can buzz it, then you should be able to play it. Uh, and But get training your ear, I think, is the hard part. But I was wondering with you guys, I mean, I started out on piano and kind of got adequate for my goals, which was to pass, uh, to test out of the college piano courses. Um, but did y'all ever play any other instruments? Like, how difficult would you say your instruments are? You want to go first, Andres, or should I? Sure. Just... Yeah, I actually started on piano also. Um, I think that's a common place to start with, with musicians sometimes. Um, but uh, especially with percussion, I feel like you either start with piano or you start with drum set. Um, so that's that's where I started. And then I actually, my, my grandfather introduced me to uh, Benny Goodman and, and, and some of his you know, jazz concerts. And so I had this kind of fascination with 
with clarinet for a while. So I tried clarinet, but just like, I don't know. It just, it didn't call to me, um, you know, sorry, clarinetists of the orchestra. Nothing, it was me. It wasn't, it wasn't (laughs) it. Um, and, and it just like the reeds, like got all nasty. Like I didn't, I didn't take care of it. So anyway, that wasn't for me. Then I tried trumpet for a little while and, and that didn't do it for me either. Um, and then I did, and then I started taking percussion, uh, lessons and I think I really enjoyed that. And I think the difficulty of it was, is also what interests me in the fact that there's so many instrument instruments that you have to be good at that you never, you can never get bored really, because if you're done working on one thing, you got to work on the next thing. And once you're done with that, you got to work on the next thing. And then you got to work on that. And then once you've done this, this thing has, has already gone down. So you got, you know, there's, there's, you got There's so many levels that you have to keep proficient. So that is the challenge of it, but it's also what I like about it. Cause it's never ending really. And, and then once, you know, and then now we're just talking about classical, but there's, you know, there's Latin percussion, there's jazz, you know, there's, there's, there's rock and roll. There's, there's, you know, hand drums, you know, there's, there's so many different, um, levels of, of, percussion and, and, and uh, genres um, that it's it, it's multiple lifetimes that you can you know spend getting good at it so that's that's what I, that's what I like about it um, that's why I kind of settled on it I think so your next step is Balinese gamelan oh yeah <laughs> like, duh yeah. It's, the, it's the next logical step <laughs> if you don't know what that is look it up it's it's a trip <laughs> it's cool. Dude, that, actually yeah do look it up that is some that is crazy it's crazy it's, it's, it's like yeah the, 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 and, it, and they all look so like nonchalant doing it but like where they fit in uh, creating this melody is is absurd you know i saw that live once when actually it was amazing in, in, in indonesia oh, wow. it was amazing yeah uh, what about you abe <laughs> where where uh yeah, yeah what was your musical path so i started on the cello um my older brother played so uh me being the stubborn and competitive one in the family i decided that i would be better than him so Wait, does that mean you're the youngest or middle or... i'm the middle i'm the middle child oh, oh yeah that makes I sense have, yeah um, <laughs> so i we're gonna need another disclaimer jo- johanna just ac- shared this uh picture of me playing my my dad's guitar like a cello on the musician's Facebook page. Um, and that was the first time that my parents decided, oh, maybe he really does want to play the cello. So that's that's how that started. And then I picked up piano from there for a few years. Um, but then when I got to fifth grade, I joined band, French horn. Woo! Yeah. And then it was too difficult for me, so I quit after a year. Was it really too difficult, or did you just not, like, take to it? No, I, I liked it. I, I either... I, it's sort of hard to get back in that mindset, but I either wasn't taking it seriously or... I actually did find it difficult enough that I decided to play string, you know, string bass as the tuba part in the in the, the wind band, you know. So maybe you <laughs> maybe you should have yeah. answered the question, "What's so hard about the horn?" Because because you quit it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, first off, I I just remember having a tough time even making a sound. Yeah. You know, I mean, for for oh, cello, yeah. you're just sort of you you know, as long as you have rosin on the bow, you can basically, you know, make a sound, and whether it squeaks or not, it's a different story. Uh, but I feel like horn or you know other brass instruments, there's just a, that really specific technique uh, that you need to even be able to make a, a pitch. And just developing that was difficult enough as it is. So Yeah, actually, I mean, Scott, the, isn't the mouthpiece a, a, a hurdle in and of itself? Um, well, okay, so I'm just going to briefly explain this. Uh, the... All brass instruments are played using a mouthpiece, and uh, like you don't just blow air through. Uh, you have to buzz your lips together um, and make like. Do it, do it. <laughs> so that's sort of the sound we're making in the mouthpiece, and it's contained uh, in in the mouthpiece. <laughs> So we can actually make music just with this, and then that all gets um, refined and amplified in a certain way in the instrument, and it makes the sound that we all know and love. Well, so, so when you're when you're practicing, though, do you actually practice using just the mouthpiece sometimes? 
Sometimes. It's okay. more like a diagnostic tool. Uh, if something's going awry in the instruments, then you can like take away the the tube and uh, and see if the, there's something wrong with the input that you're giving it. But, okay. um, but I did want to say something else about all this difficulty business. I really think that that matters at the start. Like, the horn being a difficult instrument matters when you start the horn or when you start the oboe, another notoriously difficult instrument. But when it comes to refining the scales to become uh, at the top level, I think every instrument has like this unique difficulty. It's an art form that has no end. We're always striving to be better and make it uh, this un unachievable perfection. Um, so I do think that, that that's something just to keep in mind always. Like there's no instrument at our level that, oh, well, that's the easy one. Yeah. But on that note, I do think it's about time to get to the interview. So I'm going to check out here. Y'all have fun with Monica. But first, here's Larry's joke of the week. I recently went to a meeting of Plastic Surgery Addicts Anonymous. You know, I thought I saw a lot of new faces there. Thank you, Larry. Our guest today is English horn Monica Fosna. A native of Lima, Ohio, Monica began playing oboe at the age of 10. She held positions with the New Haven Symphony, Syracuse Symphony, Rochester Philharmonic, and Kalamazoo Symphony before joining the DSO in 2012. Monica was also a fellow of the New World Symphony. Monica, welcome. Hi. Hey, Monica. <laughs> Hi. Hi, guys. It's well, great to be here. I, I, first of all, I, before we get into to you, I, you, as I was reading your bio, uh, you, you corrected me in saying that it's not Lima, Peru. It's Lima, I mean, Lima Ohio. It's Lima, Ohio. <laughs> and I, that I did not know. Yeah. And you said there was a story attached to that. Can you, can you just say that? Because, I, I, yeah, it's fascinating. <laughs> yes, it is Lima. And any, anyone from Lima will definitely correct you when you mispronounce the name of the town. Um, wow. So the story I heard uh, many years ago was that um, Lima has always been um, a hub for, for, rail, for, for trains. Um, and uh, back in the day, before Lima was even a town, that whole area of northwest Ohio, including Toledo, um, was basically a swamp, but there were a lot of, I think, natural resources, um, probably oil, uh, that they wanted to access. So, um, so they were trying to build on the swamp area, but of course there were tons of people dying of malaria um, from all the mosquitoes. And um, one of the things that helps with malaria is, um, I think it's called quinine. It's, it's the substance that's in tonic water that makes okay. it taste kind of bitter. Um, and it's, it's from a, the bark of a tree that is native to Peru. And so, you know, this is in the middle of the 1800s. There are trains coming up from South America um, full of this substance to help people, you know, not die. Um, and all these trains had the word L-I-M-A on the side of it because they were from Lima, Peru. And as the town, as the area grew and people decided to, you know, actually form you know, a city, to begin a city there, um, they didn't know what to call it. But that area had, was known as a place where these trains with this word stopped. So, okay. you know, so, <laughs> yeah. so, so they, it was, it was, they didn't, but they didn't know how to pronounce it really because this is yeah. in the middle of Ohio in the middle of the 1800s. Not, not so, too many Peruvians living there at the time. Right. Regretfully, no. <laughs> so, so, um, so they, this is the story. They took a vote and the citizens of the future Lima, Ohio voted that it was pronounced Lima. Wow. And it's been that wow. way ever since. But it's, When I it's pass really, that place on strong... 75, I'm never going to think of it the same way again. <clears throat> Nor should you. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. And I bet there's a lot of gin and tonics drunk over there, right? Just to prevent malaria. I mean. Well, I mean, there's probably a reason why it's my favorite beverage. But, you know. Yeah. 
That's but it's fun. you know there's a long line there's a long tradition in Ohio of um, European or like foreign cities being mispronounced. Um, there's Berlin, Ohio. There's Berlin. Medina, Toledo. Mm -hmm. you know, oh yeah, that's right. Supposed to be Toledo. Right. You know, so so it's it's just one of many. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I like it. I like it. I like it. It's great. Um, yeah, I well, should really Google that story see if it's actually true. <laughs> no, I, I like I like the, I like this story. I like this. I like your version. Well, all of our viewers, all of our viewers, viewers will believe it now. Yeah, so exactly. It's, it's a fact yeah. now. Um, it, it is a fact. <laughs> well, I, we want. We always ask everyone uh, starting out, "What music's on your stand right now? What, what, what are you practicing?" Uh, yeah, my um, my current practicing phase has been um, involving the Telemann fantasies. Um, Telemann wow. wrote twelve fantasies for solo flute, um, and they are very playable on the oboe. And so I've been practicing them on the English horn, which nice. I, I like to do. I like to play oboe music on the English horn. One, because not a ton of really, really good music, like solo music is written for the English horn. But these pieces are, I mean, comparable to the Bach cello suites in that they were specifically written for solo instrument. And that instrument was a woodwind instrument. So, you know, like technical things, breathing aspects, um, it really covers all these bases, but it's great music to play as well. And you don't need accompaniment. So, um, so I've been working on, on those. I, I started with the seventh one, which is in D major. Um, and now I've started on the very first one, which is in A major. Um, okay. And that's, nice. that's what I've been playing around with lately. That's cool. Um... Well, since you were just talking about the English horn and, and obviously you're playing that in the orchestra, and it's such a specific instrument in the sense that it's it's unique. There's there's one of you on stage. Um, I, I mean, we were curious about what drew you to that path to, to kind of settle on English horn. You know, I mean, it's 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 um, it's kind of fascinating to me. You know, um, a lot of people ask me that question. It is a weird instrument. I mean, first of all, its name is totally ridiculous. It's not English and it's not a horn. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, right. So it's very confusing. Um, but it's my whole oboe life, like starting already when I was a beginner student, the English horn was always a presence. <clears throat> my very first teacher um, that I studied with in Lima um, she was the English horn player of the Lima Symphony Orchestra. So oh, wow. when I went to hear the symphony, I went to hear her play English horn. And cool. yet she taught me oboe lessons. So, you know, she did both. And it was totally normal to me that someone would play both. Did you um, start on oboe, though? Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, I mean, this is, this is actually something that um, I think applies to all the, what's known as auxiliary winds. Mm. So like bass clarinet, E flat clarinet, contrabassoon, piccolo, mm -hmm. um, we all start on the main instrument. Mm -hmm. Like you never, okay. you never go to school to study the English horn. That mm -hmm. doesn't happen. Okay. Um, it's something that you kind of pick up along the way, or are intrigued by, or enthusiastic enough about that you think, you know, I could do this. Yeah. And, and that basically is what happened to me. Um, one of my very first big solo moments uh, when I was in high school happened on the English horn. And it was wow. in this piece written for band um, called The Light Eternal. And there's a story behind this piece. I'll just tell it to you briefly. It's, it's a piece that was written um, about these four wow. army chaplains who were on um, an American Navy vessel in World War II. And this vessel, it was in the Atlantic and it was torpedoed by German U-boat. And um, it, was, it sank very quickly, but these four army chaplains um, gave their lives to help make sure that as many of the sailors were rescued as possible. Mm. And yeah. um, the story is that they gave up their own life jackets and that as the ship was sinking, they prayed together and sang hymns. 
Wow. So so the piece kind of like that scene in the Titanic story. that that chamber chamber quartet the, the, same yeah, thing right yeah actually very yeah very similar the, the where strings, they played on right yeah they played yeah on. the strings played on <laughs> um, so these guys gave up their life jackets had no hope of surviving and and they stayed on the on the boat and so the the piece itself just tells the story it starts off with a you know jaunty nautical theme. And then it leads into like a battle type scene with lots of percussion, of course. Yeah, and right. then um, there's a big explosion. And then a beautiful hymn-like melody is played by the English horn. Um, and I remember the very first rehearsal, I played this solo. And the conductor, who also composed the piece, stopped the rehearsal and he, he had tears in his eyes and he said, now I know why I wrote this for the English horn. Oh, wow. And like That's an amazing story. clarinet players were crying and, and I got a lot of attention for this and I liked it. So <laughs> I... <laughs> <laughs> wow. So one of the things that is always amazing about, I think about the English horn is that it seems like in, in the story that you just described, it seems like something big happens and then everything falls away. And then suddenly the English horn plays, or you know, like in the New World Symphony, the English horn starts, uh, you know, starts with a beautiful melody. So, yeah. how does when you're sitting there in orchestra, then let's say sometimes you're sitting for what 20, 25 minutes before having to come in with the solo, having not really played in a while. How do you yeah. prepare yourself for that? Um, I, th I think a lot of practice. Okay. Of no, really? Waiting. No. Of waiting. <laughs> yeah. But okay. I mean, you get it's something that you get used to. It's a different kind of stress. You know, okay. when when you're a principal, when you're a principal, wind player, you know, you're playing all the time, and then a solo pops up, and you play it, and then you keep playing, and then another solo pops up, and there's sort of like a pacing that you have to do. Whereas with the English horn, it very frequently the pacing is more with how you wait and how you just kind of, I mean, for me, I just, I go into this almost, well, I try, I try to like be <laughs> as Zen as possible mm -hmm. um, and not really think about what is about to happen until I absolutely have to. And the funny thing is, is that there are certain parts of pieces like the new world symphony, for example, there's a part in the first movement where the nerves start to kick in. And it's the same oh, wow. place. It's like this musical cue of, okay, you gotta, you gotta get up to bat soon. So yeah. this is the same you know? place. Every, so every performance, the same place for you each time, the nerves kick in. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I can yeah. kind of see it, you starting to get a little nervous thinking about it. I know my eyes are getting wide. I'm like, oh. I mean, it, percussion is um, similar in the sense that, you know, we're, I mean, most pieces we're sitting around and then we play and it, and, you know, a lot of times it's a solo, you know, because it's, it's one to a part. But, you know, it's similar. It's like, you know, there's that there's a lot of these, uh, you know, hills, you know, and, and you know, you yeah. play and then you wait and then you play and you wait. And there, there is that when you don't play, there's that kind of like mental focus that you need to sustain throughout, you know. So I, I definitely understand that. Yeah, you can't. Um, I mean, I often just enjoy listening to my colleagues because that distracts me and also can be very inspiring. Um, because often, I mean, most of the pieces that, you know, that I get to play are really wonderful works in the repertoire. Right. So, right. you know, sitting there and listening to Shostakovich 10 for a half hour is not a chore. Yeah, not a bad gig. Me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but you do, have to, you do have to be really careful. There are some technical things you have to be aware of like you don't want to over soak the reed but you can't under soak the reed you know every once in a while if there's a little moment in a loud section where i can play along yeah just to make sure everything's working <laughs> right right i might right. do that oh, wow. okay that's cool um, that's cool you know tricky tricky little i'm gonna keep things, an eye out but... for that from from like during a piece <laughs> yeah. now i think that's what isn't supposed to play here <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> exactly <laughs> what is she doing well um that's awesome i mean truly you you're one of the most amazing whenever you play like everyone just turns their head and it, it's it's always beautiful so um you know I, thank yeah. you 
But um, another thing that I really admire about you uh, has nothing to do with music. You, you, I think you are an incredible athlete. And uh, I just wanted to see if you could tell us a little bit about that. I mean, you know, what you do. Tell everyone about, about that because it's, it's pretty incredible. Um, well, I, I would like to just say for the record that I'm a pretty average athlete that has a lot of enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's half the um, battle. Yeah. 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 Uh, I just, I, I love doing it. Um, I was, I was a tomboy growing up. I still am really, to be honest. And, um, I started doing running races already in the sixth grade and, um, I started cycling a lot in high school. My brother is a really great cyclist um, and he would do these long rides. And so I, I got into it a little bit, not as much as him, but we did um, a couple, we did this thing together called GOBA, the Great Ohio Bike Adventure, which was 50 miles a day for, I don't know, a week or something. Wow. wow. Um, is it across the states? It's sort of, a, they pick a city and you go around the city. Okay. Um, and it, you know, there's just something really satisfying about riding your bike all day and then only worrying about food and showering and sleeping. Like it's <laughs> simple, very simple. Something really refreshing yeah. about yeah. that. Um, but I, I've always really liked running. This always the sport I was best at. Um, so I've always, I just, I've kept up running ever since, you know, high school track ended. I've maintained it to a point. Um, and I didn't start, I, I've, I've run four marathons and, um, the wow. first one was, um, I think it was 2006 it was my very first one. And, um, the most recent one was this past October I did Chicago and I was supposed to do wow. one a week ago, but of course it got canceled. So, but yeah. didn't you, didn't you, weren't you, did you do something for, uh, like a fundraiser too for that? Was that, I did, someone? I did. Well, I, I wanted to finish my marathon training, um, just to see how it felt. And also, I mean, I had a lot more free time than I was used to, mm -hmm. um, starting in March. So, so I decided to finish the training, but I thought I should do something as like a final gesture. And, you know, maybe I can, I don't know, raise some money for someone who needs it along the way. So what I, what I ended up doing was I, I entered into four different virtual races. Um, and the total of those four races equaled just under 26 miles. Okay. And one of them was for organ donation and the other three were for food banks. Mm. And, um, it really just, it was, a, it was just a nice way for me to finish, to celebrate all the hard work I had done, mm -hmm. um, but still give to someone who, who really needs help right now. Um, and uh, so I finished, I did, the final race was last Saturday, and I called it my COVID-19 miler, um, where I ran... <laughs> I combined two of the races. I combined the half marathon, which is 13 miles, and the 10K, which is six miles. I combined those kind of into one 19-mile race. Um, wow. And I took it really seriously. Like, I tried to go as fast as I could and pace myself. And, um, and it was a perfect day for it. I lucked out. And, uh, and I, 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 you know, put my results online and... They sent me a shirt and a medal, and <laughs> that is so awesome. So it's kind of like I That's actually, <laughs> Monica, Monica, better you than me, better you than me. I, yeah, that's amazing. So do you find do you find that in you know we were talking about sometimes pacing in the orchestra, you know, when you're sitting there playing with a hundred other people on stage, you can use that energy. And I, I remember in a couple of races I've run, I felt similar in the fact that you know maybe I'm not going to run. Like I haven't trained to run as fast as I might during the race because there's just so much of that energy. So how does that differ from when you're doing the virtual races? Do you do you did you still feel like you had that extra energy or? That's a really good question. Um, I did because I had trained for that moment. It's actually okay. just like preparing for for a performance. Okay. You know, you you 
Um, when I get ready for a performance, especially a, a big one, um, I train so that the performance seems easier than the training. Right. You know, like I, I practice in a way where um, I play it over and over again in a certain way. I record myself. I, you know, try do all these things so that the performance, um, even if it isn't effortless, because very few of them are, I mean, let's <laughs> right. be honest, but that it f seems yeah. um, easier. And, you know, just like that, a, a marathon, you know, you spend four and a half, five months training so that on a certain day, at a certain time, you are your best runner. Um, so it's actually very applicable to yeah. being a musician and, and you know, pacing, pacing oneself through a race um, and, you know, finding those moments where it's hard because you can't run 26 miles without it being hard at mm -hmm. some point. I mean, it's just hard to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. So everyone gets to that point of, this doesn't feel good, but then you learn how to live with the uncomfortableness of it. What happens if you don't feel good in mile mile one or so? Like, like, well, how do you deal with that? You, you just you just power you through. through. <laughs> you just power through. Okay, okay, cool. I'll try it. I'll try that next time. Yeah, but it's it, it's um, you know, learning to live with a little bit of um, discomfort. Um, I think that also applies to performance because. You know, performing is hard, just yeah. like running a marathon is hard. Yeah. So. Somehow, somehow I'm thinking almost more about auditions than I am about a performance when you're talking. No, it, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. No, that's very applicable to that as well. Um, because there are, there are days where you go out for your training run and you feel terrible. Yeah. And there yeah. are days when you're practicing and <clears throat> it doesn't sound the way you want it to sound. Right, And yeah. it's really easy to get mentally blocked by that, but... Discouraged. You know, tomorrow yeah. is always yeah. another day. Yeah. Well, there are days too on auditions or performances. You wake up and it's like, oh, today is not the day. Yeah, yeah. Today, yeah today is not the day. Yeah. And yeah. I and I have run races um, where I'm at that starting line. And actually, one was the Detroit Half Marathon a few years ago. It was super humid at 6:30 oh. in the morning. It was 70 degrees and it was awful. And I just thought, you know what? This is not going to be. This is not going to be fun today. <laughs> So I just, I kind of started a slow pace and I tucked in and I finished. Wow. Oh, that's amazing. That is freaking and, awesome. Um, you know, sometimes you just have to do it. Yeah. So. And, and also another thing I wanted to, I wanted to touch on but that people may not know about you is that you are a, in my opinion, a fantastic baker. And like, <laughs> you know, you, you sometimes give us some of your, some of your offerings uh, during, during breaks and rehearsal, which I always love. But just maybe, maybe you could just uh, tell us how you started with that and, and why you like it. Like, you know, how is that an outlet for you? Um, well, my mom is a baker. So when I was growing up, um, you know, there were always cookies at Christmas time. And she didn't bake birthday cakes. She baked birthday pies, wow, which is where my awesome. obsession with pie comes from, I think. <clears throat> Um, so everyone in my family had a specific pie that she would make for our birthday. Mine was Which, coconut cream. <laughs> coconut cream. Okay. Yeah. Just like my dad. Um, but, uh, you know, one, like one brother really loved cherry pie and another brother really loved rhubarb. And so, um, so that's, I think where it came from. Um, I remember baking with my mom at a pretty early age and then, branching off and doing my own baking, which she let me do. Um, she was very like generous with, you know, time in the kitchen in that yeah, way. Yeah. Um, but, uh, for me, it's, it's, it's sort of, um, I feel often with, with our profession, you know, you're always working towards this ideal that you can never really achieve. You know, there's no such thing as perfect really in what we do, right. yeah. but, you know, if you make a rhubarb pie, <laughs> that's perfection. even if it doesn't look perfect, <laughs> yeah, it probably tastes pretty close yeah. to perfection. So yeah. there's, I think anything that has that end goal that you then get to enjoy. <laughs> and if not, just add um, more sugar, right? Like, right. Then yeah. it's perfect. <laughs> Cover yeah. it with ice cream. No one will know. <laughs> yeah. Then that's perfection. 
Yeah, but Monica, Scott told us to ask you about red birds and lemon desserts. <laughs> is that uh, is that something you can share with us? Yes. So, okay. <laughs> well, I mean, it's it, there's not much to it. It's just um, I uh, I have an affinity for lemon desserts. Okay. And I also really like red birds, specifically cardinals. Oh, nice. <laughs> I think they're very pretty. A lot of those around um, here. I see yeah, a but a friend of mine, um, a really good friend of mine, <clears throat> will often introduce me, when she introduces me to people, she will say, this is my friend Monica. She loves red birds and lemon desserts. And, <laughs> and that's like... That's, how, <laughs> that's a nice that's a description. Idea. Yeah. Like long yeah. walks on the and so, beach. And, and they kind of look at me like... <laughs> <laughs> okay that's um, funny uh yeah. abe you had a question right um, yeah so monica i had one more question that i was going to ask you and i think a lot of people would be uh, really interested to know this about you so how does the rite of spring go for me <laughs> wah, wah, wah. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> yes <laughs> So which much. which part is that in? <laughs> oh, oh, oh. You know, right before the alto has flute. so many great moments in that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my other favorite one is not, 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 Nice. We got two out of you. That's amazing. <laughs> nice. And the opening's great, too. I mean, you know, my the, my back and forth call with the bassoon is is also really, really wonderful. And that goes. Da, 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 da. So. That is wait. I'm gonna do another. Nice. Yeah, very very That's nice. Great. I'm adding a DJ air horn to that, by the way, because oh, nice. celebration. <laughs> nice, nice job, Monica. Monica, it's uh, awesome to see you. R ran out of time, but um, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, yeah, thank you, you so know, much, Monica. Yeah, great yeah, talking to you. Always, always oh, it was nice great talking you. with you guys. It's really great to see you. Bye. Yeah. And uh, hopefully you can hear your beautiful solos very soon in Orchestra Hall. Um, but uh, until then, take care. You too, guys. Be well. Thank you all so much for joining us. On the next episode of Between Two Stands, we will be interviewing bassist Nick Myers. If you have any questions for us or for our guests, please email us at betweentwostands at gmail.com and we will try to answer them. Also, don't forget to tune in to the upcoming watch parties on Facebook Live. Thank you so much for watching and see you next time.